So I think we can get started. I'm not sure if everybody has arrived back from a coffee break, but anyway, uh, welcome from my side uh, to this panel. My name is Jens Boysen. I'm from the German Historical Institute here in Warsaw. And I'm honored that the organizers have entrusted me with chairing this panel. Um, I know the chairperson are not supposed to be talking very much, but just steering the talking of others. I just would allow myself two sentences picking up on, on this morning's discussions when it came very clear to me that when we talk about the regions or regionalization of a memory scape, so to say, I guess that the, the human dimension, the personal dimension is, is crucial. So there can be a spatial dimension in a strict sense, but it need not. And I come without wishing to add to the confusion of terminology, but everybody uses that chance. I would like to throw in the term of communities of concern. So maybe it's some, rather about who feels somehow concerned or, or uh, related to an event that, that they have heard of, regardless of where that was, distant from them or other, because it's not natural, or not necessarily so that geographic proximity enhances the feeling of concern, can be quite different. So it maybe it's less a matter of spatial proximity or, or distance, but rather of, of the specific situation of certain groups in the global context. But this is just my, my two sentences at the beginning, because I'm not the person to present here. So we will start our panel, uh, which has the overall title of Fragmentation of Trauma, Memories of Mass Violence Between the Global and the Local. So again, of course, this issue of yeah, multi-level, if you wish, uh, uh, memorialization. Um, and let's get right to the matter. Our first speaker is uh, Sławomir Kapralski from, uh, from Krakow, from the Pedagogical University of Krakow, where he is professor of sociology and also uh, works at the Graduate School for Social Research uh, of the Polish Academy of Sciences here in Warsaw. Um, I will not read the whole presentation, it will be too long, but uh, he is um, an, an expert on issues of nationalism, anti-Semitism, in particular, as I understand, on the situation, history of the Roma, as maybe a group that sometimes gets a bit less attention than other victim groups, but this is, this is, is one of his specializations. And the title of presentation today is The Holocaust Commemorated But Not Remembered. So that picks up on the debate we had earlier, what does remembering mean, actually, or can it mean? Post-colonial and post-traumatic perspectives on the reception of the Holocaust memory discourse in Poland. So very complex title, and I'll leave the floor to you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there is a complex title of my presentation because there is a complex story behind it, and uh, I want to introduce it very briefly before I start uh, reading our. So just be, everybody text. has about 20 minutes. About 20, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so 25 years ago, I uh, I was in a research team um, led by uh, Jonathan Weber at that time from Oxford, um, and. Uh, that was probably the first uh, large-scale effort to collect a recollection of the Polish non-Jewish uh, people uh, regarding their memories of the Jews and uh, the Holocaust. I was conducting interviews and later on I was promoted to the position of the coordinator of research teams. Um, and I've had a lot of experience at that time. You know, this uh, material has never been properly uh, studied, and only uh, now, it means two years ago, we received, uh, myself and my colleagues from Krakow, we received a permission from Jonathan Weber to return to that material and to analyze that. Uh, in addition, we also start a new series of interview with the next generation to see what is the difference in perception. This means that um, I have a very peculiar experience because while studying these old interviews, I'm revisiting myself 25 years ago. And since an idea came up uh, today in Derek Sayer's presentation that memory replaces reality, I must say that in uh, many ways I'm not sure whether I'm speaking now about the uh, way uh, Polish people remembered the Holocaust or about the way I remembered Polish people remembering the Holocaust 25 <laughs> years ago. And to solve this puzzle, I want to present this uh, paper. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this presentation focuses on the reception of the globalized narrative of the Holocaust in the regional memories of East Central Europe, Poland in particular. 
It is argued that this narrative uh, has not been successfully integrated in the original memory, partly because of the narrative's own deficiencies and partly due to the specific nature of the way in which original memories have been produced. It is claimed here that to understand this phenomenon, we shall put uh, the remembrance and commemoration of the Holocaust in the context of the post-communist transformation in which the memory of the Holocaust has been constructed rather than retrieved in the process of recomposition of identities that faced existential insecurity. The impulse to this research has come from the second encounter with the set of more than 200 interviews conducted in the years 1989-1993 among the inhabitants of small towns and villages in southern Poland who at the time were old enough to have autobiographical memories of their Jewish neighbors and personal recollections of their fate during the Holocaust. I have participated in collecting that material, and now I am a part of a team that revisits this evidence uh, that has never been thoroughly studied in a project titled In the Footsteps of Memory, Strategies of Remembering the Jewish Culture in Polish Galicia, generously financed by the National Center of Science of the Republic of Poland. This peculiar experience uh, of revisiting the empirical evidence 25 years after it was collected has an impact on the way the author, means myself, intends to interpret it. When approached from today's perspective, the interviews constitute an entirely different message than the one we were ready to read in the time of their collection. That is because the researchers have changed. It may suggest that correspondingly, the message sent by the interviewees 25 years ago could have been different than their original experience of the time of the Holocaust, because they have changed. This experience makes me think of memory, not in the sense of meneme, the transmission of the past experiences into the present, but rather to approach it as anamnesis, a contextually conditioned recollection of the past that is instrumental for construction or protection of our collective identities. In other words, it is assumed here that when 25 years ago our interviewees shared with us their memories of the Holocaust, they have been in fact searching for the meaning of the past that would be useful in their contemporary, that is in the time of the interview, situation of elderly people facing radical post-communist transformation of their country, attempting to curtail the existential anxiety and imagine themselves as those in control of contingency and able to maintain integrity in difficult moments. In addition, I would conventionally assume that individual reminiscences of their past uh, form their remembrance or recollection. When individuals communicate and discuss those recollections among themselves, their remembrance becomes social memory. When cultural frames and social institutions support and sometimes induce or even create certain forms of social memory, then the collective memory of a given community emerges. We can therefore speak of two genealogies of memory. The first one is organized according to the principle of distribution of energy and leads from individual recollections that fuel social memory and then become sedimented in the forms of collective memory. The second genealogy follows the principle of information control and leads from institutional collective memory that enhances certain forms of communication peculiar to social memory while marginalizing others, which decides which of the individual recollections will have a chance to become a topic of conversation and what shape they may take. The Holocaust didn't seem to be the crucial part of the recollections of our speaking partners. They preferred to focus on the pre-war, peaceful, in their opinion, coexistence of the two groups. When asked directly about their memories of the Holocaust, they were usually able to provide a lot of details regarding the persecution of Jews in their towns and villages, 
sometimes with empathy, sometimes with indifference. But generally, the tragic fate of Jews was perceived by them as one of many other episodes of the war or the German occupation of Poland. Moreover, it has been striking that many interviewees who during the interview didn't uh, express anti-Semitic views, neither in traditional religious version nor in the modern political one, started to refer to anti-Semitic cliches precisely at the moment when asked about the Holocaust. This may confirm the thesis by Wolfgang Benz that anti-Semitism receives, particularly in the periods of crisis, much broader meaning than the animosity towards Jews. It serves as a principle of reordering the universe in a meaningful way as an instrument of communication that enables majority to arrive at a common understanding and as a dormant cultural code that, when activated, can be used as an expression of quite different tendencies. Our interviewees had the recollections of the Holocaust, but they didn't seem to communicate about this issue too often. And when they did so, in the absence of an elaborated public discourse of the Holocaust in Poland before 1989, they were often employing anti-Semitic cultural frames. These frames would help them to reorder their post-Holocaust experience in a meaningful way by presenting the fate of Jews as, as something they had deserved, either as the ones who crucified uh, Jesus or as those who plot to rule the world. If we refer to the two genealogies of memory presented earlier, we shall say that regarding the memory of the Holocaust, the individual remembrance on the one hand didn't bring enough energy in the process of memory production, and on the other hand, the lack of an elaborated cultural frame of interpreting the Holocaust made the space open for dormant anti-Semitic code to be used by interviewees to give meaning to and express their experience. I would argue um, that to interpret the absence of the remembrance of the Holocaust uh, among the non-Jewish Poles, it would be appropriate to use social theory of uh, trauma that assumes that memory of atrocities is not an obvious and immediate follow-up of a historical event, but a result of the way in which the event is approached by community. In other words, the recollection of violence is a social cultural construction that reflects the way in which past events are represented in the master narratives that form the collective memory of a community, namely as something that has threatened its collective identity. To remember a past, people need a classificatory scheme, a narrative, a concept that would organize their personal recollections, give them a meaning and a language in which they could be spoken out. In other words, to remember mass murder of Jews as the Holocaust, one needs, first of all, the elaborated discourse of the Holocaust. Levy and Schneider similarly argue that, I quote, for the Holocaust to be recognized as something unique, a discursive and political frame of reference needed to be put in place, end of the quote. Consequently, I would argue that the question why the non-Jewish Poles didn't acknowledge that they had been the witnesses of the horrifying event should be replaced with the following one. Why the master narrative of the Holocaust was not put in place as the frame of interpretation of their experience, and why later on, when Poles have been confronted with the Holocaust discourse, they have largely rejected it. The development of such frame has been hindered partly because of the politics of memory of the communist regime that imposed its own vision of the Second World War, concurring with the Marxist concept of history in which racially motivated genocide was a secondary phenomenon caused by an interplay of the economic forces. The other obstacle was the lack of perception that what happened to Jews affects the collective identity of the non-Jewish Poles. As Jeffrey Alexander points out, I uh, quote, the Polish people have acknowledged that Jews were victims of mass murder, but they have often refused to experience their own national collective identities as being affected by the Jews' tragic fate, end of quotation. 
Only when the encounter with the Holocaust discourse started to threaten the identity of the Poles as represented in the romantic code of the Polish culture, that is, as a heroic freedom fighters and the most victimized nation, they included the Holocaust in their collective memory, acknowledged the fact that mass murder of Jews was the historical event of utmost importance, but instead of showing compassion, many of them projected onto Jews the negative feelings they started to experience when their identity has been questioned. The encounter with the Holocaust discourse involved also a significant number of cultural and, and educational initiatives, publications, and conferences which took place after the collapse of communism. Most important among these developments have been changes in the school curricula and special programs addressed to teachers in the field of education about the Holocaust. In addition, a number of commemorative ceremonies with the participation of the authorities helped to focus public opinion on the previously neglected Jewish aspects of Polish history. The process of change has particularly involved the area of Auschwitz-Birkenau, where the museum exhibition has been refurbished with the participation of Jewish institutions to emphasize the role of the place as the symbol of the Holocaust. This process occurred in the atmosphere of instability and insecurity that was connected with social, political, and economic transformation and increased the structural trauma which was the response of lar large sectors of the post-communist society to the immense change in their lives. The anxieties associated with the structural trauma of the present might have an impact on the historical traumas experienced in the past, following La Capra and thus contribute to the deflection of memories. This might be the case of our respondents in the 1990s. Their anxieties of that time set in motion identity protection mechanisms which largely ruled out the chance of self-critical historical examination and identification with the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. Instead, they preferred to recall a nostalgic image of the past that would bring some comfort in their present identity crisis. In such a context, the attempts of the Polish intellectual elite to face the problem of the Holocaust and to include the memory of the Jews in the collective memory of Polish society have, in the eyes of many Poles, undermined the nostalgic image of the past, enforced a critical rethinking of identity, and have been met with distrust. Therefore, the rejection of the Holocaust discourse by large sectors of the Polish society can be interpreted as a part of the post-traumatic syndrome. In the 1990s, the cosmopolitanized memories of the Holocaust have started to serve as means of reorganization of the value consensus in Western Europe after the collapse of communism and as a normative standard set up for the former communist countries that struggled to be included in the European system. This is Levy and Schneider's view. But in the following years, the discourse of the Holocaust has not turned into a reference for the constructing, perceiving, and representing the imagined European community. Especially in Eastern Europe, the Holocaust as the event and as the frame of historical perception has not found the way to the social memories and is largely confined in the elitist discourse and institutional rituals of remembrance. The reasons of this failure could be found firstly in the peculiarities of social memory in the countries of Eastern Europe, and secondly, in the deficiencies of the Holocaust discourse, especially in its popular and politicized form. Among the particularities of the East European memory, one can list the following factors. The legacy of the vision of history uh, instituted by the communist governments that has curtailed the murder of Jews. The re-emergence of the specific ethno-cultural Eastern European nationalism with its particularism and anti-Semitism. The widespread perception that the historical suffering of the non-Jewish East Europeans is not properly recognized in Europe in opposition to the Jewish one. The specific form of the competition of victims often corresponds uh, with the belief that, uh, as Dan Stone argues, the focus of the Holocaust on the Holocaust prevents people from investigating or taking equally seriously cases which do not appear to be exactly like it. 
Then the defensive reactions to the opening of the silenced chapters of the history of collaboration in the Holocaust, explicable with the help of the mechanisms of um, protecting threatened collective identities. Then the perception of the Holocaust discourse as an instrument of the economic cultural colonization of Eastern Europe, whereby Eastern Europeans are expected to buy a ticket to Western civilization by adopting its cultural codes. Finally, the contribution of the Holocaust debates to the political divide and unrest, augmented by the split of the cultural frames and elitist discourses. Among the deficiencies of the Holocaust discourse, one could list the following ones. The cosmopolitanization of the Holocaust discourse transcended nation as the frame of memory, which has been hardly acceptable by the societies of Eastern Europe that cherished their newly regained or reconstructed nationhood. Secondly, it is argued that the Holocaust discourse has been threatened by an inflation of rhetoric and exaltation of memory that led to the dissolution of its actual meaning into abstraction and the convenient hypnosis that prevents us from knowing what actually is to remember. Thirdly, in this contributes to the mythologi mythologization of the Holocaust discourse as the founding narrative of the post-Holocaust Europe that conceals the deficiency of political identity and serves as a surrogate one. Such mythologized discourse turns out to be cognitively inept to render explicable the past events in spite of its honest rhetoric of remembrance. It may also be perceived as politically instrumentalized and linked with other elements of the Western European foundational myth that have been politically used to perpetuate the 18th century construction of Eastern Europe as a liminal shadow zone with no culture, identity, or memory. The situation resembles thus very much a deadlock in which the critical potential of the Holocaust discourse is rejected by those who are professing the East European version finishing, uh, of redemptive mythology, while the discourse's own mythologization puts off those East European who otherwise consider it an important vantage point in critically reflecting upon the memories and perceptions of the past in their societies. To conclude, it must be said that the Holocaust has been in post-communist Poland commemorated on the level of official institutions, rituals of memory, and elitist discourses, but not necessarily remembered, because the official frames are often inconsistent and, besides, do not perform well the role of organizing the social and collective memories, for the reasons outlined here. The individual remembrance and social memory of individuals is therefore formed not by an overarching frame, but rather as a consequence of the identity crisis of the 1990s that was also responsible for activating the anti-Semitic cultural code, subsequently employed as a language in which the memory of the Holocaust has been expressed in the interviews we collected. Thus, we may speak of overt silences in connection with individual memories and covert silences in connection with official frames and collective memories that do not have sufficient content to successfully organize social memories and give individuals an adequate language in which they could express their recollection. It seems that the memory of the Holocaust has been treated by some sectors of Polish society, mostly those affected by the trauma of transformation, as interfering with the Polish memory understood as the celebration of nationhood. For it has questioned both the heroism of the Poles and their self-proclaimed status as the main victims. This largely prevented the memory of the Holocaust from being included in Poland's memory in spite of noble efforts and has divided public opinion, thus leading to the polarization of standpoints revealed by the survey's results. The time of the transformation is not the most convenient period for a critical re-examination of the past. Even if it calls for the revision of mythological views, it is usually a tiny fraction of society that advances critical memory. For the remaining part, threatened in their ontological security, memories served as trenches and myth as a protection. When such people share their recollections with us, we may learn from them more about their present situation than about the past they witnessed. Thank you. Thank you,
professor. Uh, just one minute over time. This is a very good example setting for the others. We just go on uh, with our next speaker, Kate McGregor. We've heard Kate already this morning on the round tables, already know the general thrust of her research uh, focusing on history uh, Southeast Asia, in particular with a view to uh, transnational memory, etc. The uh, keep it short here to not repeat everything, but just uh, turn to the concrete title of her presentation now: Global Memory Scapes and International People's Tribunal for the 1965 Violence in Indonesia. So, again, the, the question is: how, how global can memory, so can I say, connections go? Or you will explain it in detail. The floor is yours. Thank you. I have a PowerPoint. Do yes, is it here already? Sorry, it's been installed, so uh, <laughs> switch it up. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I'll do that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a problem. Okay, so firstly, today I wanted to dedicate my paper to my friend and a former interviewee. Ah, okay. Ibrahim Issa, who died earlier today. Ibrahim Issa was a political exile trapped outside of Indonesia who tried to raise alarm about abroad about the slaughter unfolding in Indonesia through his networks in the Asia-Africa People's Solidarity Network, which is an organization based in Egypt and then in China. Um, and so he raised this alarm in 1966 and 1965 about the unfolding mass killings in Indonesia, which largely fell on deaf ears at that time. Building on the framework I introduced earlier, this paper starts from the premise again that one country can be simultaneously connected to multiple regions of memory. And in this paper, I'm using the term global memory scapes in my title to signal this. And this is a term from Phillips and Rees who define a global memory scape, quote, as a complex landscape upon which memories and memory practices move, come into contact and are contested by and contest other forms of remembrance. So I'm using the concept of regions of memory here again to think not just about the physical region of Indonesia where it's located, Southeast Asia, but also the countries to which it is connected through historical processes, including colonization and occupation, but also the Cold War, and also through parallel memory and human rights related struggles. So I need to flag for those of you who are not as familiar with Indonesian history, this country was colonized by the Dutch for several hundred years, and the Japanese replaced the Dutch for a three year short period during the war. Indonesia's decolonization coincided with the beginning of the Cold War, such that its domestic politics took on global significance in terms of the competition for influence between the Soviet Union, the United States, and also increasingly China. It was in that context that the mass scale army directed violence of 1965, which claimed half a million lives, began. The long lasting anti communist regime of General Suharto that took over after 1965 meant that for many years it was not possible to address the harms inflicted during that period. Since the late 1990s, however, there have been ongoing struggles within Indonesia as to how to address the injustices of that period. And in that process of that struggle, Indonesian human rights activists have drawn on multiple examples from around the world as to how they might approach a resolution. It was based on this process of awareness of global memory struggles that activists formulated the idea of holding a people's tribunal for the 1965 violence, which took place in November last year. Um, next slide, please. Sorry. So just, um, yeah, that's the concept of global memory scapes. Sorry, I'm more, and next one. That's just a brief outline of what I'll talk about today. I won't go through that. But I'll, I need to flag for you just a little bit more information about the violence, what it involved, before I talk about the tribunal. On the 30th of September 1965, an armed movement kidnapped and killed six military generals and one lieutenant. The army, under the command of Major General Suharto, quickly suppressed that movement and blamed the action on the Indonesian Communist Party. In order to encourage anti-communist hysteria and to pave the way for a large-scale violent repression, the army began to spread propaganda about the movement, emphasizing communist barbarity. 
So between 1965 and 1968, the army and anti-communist coalitions killed, as I said, almost half a million people who were largely unarmed, and they also imprisoned 600,000 people for varying periods of time without trial in prisons and penal colonies throughout Indonesia. And some of them were still in jail, a small number were still in jail in 1998 when the regime fell. The targets of the repression were members of the Indonesian Communist Party, but also members of affiliated or closely associated organizations of youth, women, farmers, teachers, university staff, and students. Primary responsibility for that repression lay in Indonesian hands, but foreign governments also played a part in the repression. The West and Western regimes, including the Netherlands and the US and Australia, largely supported the regime due to its policy of open markets and development, ignoring the army's continued violent repression of any opposition to the re regime in the form of Muslim political protest, student protests, and also armed separatist movements in East Timor, Papua, and Aceh. Throughout the 32 years of the New Order regime of President Suharto, the repression of the party was celebrated as a victory over national traitors. You just have the next one oh, sorry. What, The next one again. So this is an example of the annual commemoration which still goes ahead, which is called Sacred Pancasila Day, in which the repression of the communists is effectively celebrated. Meanwhile, and members of the nation are told every year to be forever vigilant with regards to a communist threat that might appear in any form at any time. Meanwhile, former political prisoners and their families and the families of those killed in 1965 were subject to ongoing legal discrimination and community prejudice and surveillance. The next slide as well. So since the fall of Suharto in 1998, there's been far greater freedom of expression and greater attention to human rights in Indonesia. Sorry, slow down. Sorry. <laughs> okay. This has created more space for advocacy on behalf of survivors of the violence. But there are also ongoing sensitivities to this history, often expressed in the forms of intense anti-communism, such as actions to disrupt conferences or meetings of former political prisoners. There have been some successes in relation to increased recognition of survivors of the violence, but there have also been many more setbacks and ongoing, as I said, discrimination against these groups. In the early post Suharto period, so after 1998, Indonesians looked to many transnational models of transitional justice as possible models for Indonesia and how they could settle their human rights claims. Drawing on global memory, they considered the South African TRC as a model, and they began to work towards legislation for Indonesia. By 2001, the National Commission of Human Rights and NGOs had prepared a draft bill for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They passed a law to help set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but due to a sticking point over um, proposed amnesties for perpetrators, the Constitutional Court cancelled that law in 2006. And that was the beginning of an ongoing deadlock over this issue. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the most significant achievements, however, um, with regards to this case was the report of the National Commission of Human Rights of the 1965 violence. This report was the result of four years of detailed research across Indonesia, commencing in 2008, and it was released in July 2012. The Commission found that gross human rights violations, including killings, exterminations, slavery, forced removal from an area, restrictions on physical freedom, torture, rape, and other forms of sexual violence, forced disappearances, and persecution had taken place. The Commission attributed responsibility for the violence to several branches of the military for these crimes. The Commission recommended further investigations um, under the Attorney General, and that could have resulted in an ad hoc human rights tribunal. Um, if um, or otherwise a non-judicial settlement if agreed to by survivors, such as a TRC. But the Attorney General at that time um, sat on the report until November 2012 before finally sending it back to the Commission requesting revisions and more information. This process of requests for revisions, more information has continued until 2014, after the presidential election when the Attorney General was also, a new Attorney General was appointed. During that delayed process, the Commission has only been authorised to release an executive summary of their hundreds and hundreds of page report based on the survivor testimony from hundreds of people. So the full report remains embargoed and it's not released to the public, not released to former political prisoners, etc. Now, 
Another uh, slide, sorry. <laughs> the idea for the People's Tribunal first came about in 2013, during the long period in which there was this stall in justice efforts. The trigger for this idea was the screening of the now famous film, The Act of Killing, in which former executioners based in the Sumatran city of Medan boast about killing people in 1965 and also reenact those killings, demonstrating graphic and macabre scenes of torture and execution. Since its release in 2012, the same year as the National Commission of Human Rights report came out, the film had begun to attract increasing global attention. Many people with no connections to Indonesia learned about the case of mass atrocity for the first time through the film, and it received strong attention at least in the world of academia and also in the film world. Part of this reception may of course be related to the kind of exoticization that Anne mentioned in, in the possible receptions of films. The sequel, The Look of Silence, which focuses on the story of Adi, whose brother was murdered in 1965, and his dangerous journey to interview perpetrators of the killings in his local area also attracted similar attention. In a sense then, following Astrid Earle's concept of traveling transcultural memory, the films demonstrated the potential transformation of the case of the 1965 violence from a little known case to one that was now making its mark in global memory, potentially also the possibility of prosthetic memory there as well. The international reception of those films for activists was a real eye-opener because they began to see that perhaps this was a way in, in terms of international pressure refract refracting back into Indonesia. For example, when the film was nominated for an Oscar in 2013, government representatives in Indonesia were forced to comment to international media about their position on the violence. So following a screening of the film The Act of Killing in the Netherlands in 2013, a group of Indonesian activists came up with the idea for a people's tribunal to be held outside of Indonesia. It had to be outside Indonesia because of the ongoing anti-communist pressure um, on the events that I've mentioned before. But there were other reasons for choosing a people's tribunal in terms of format. One of the leading advocates and organisers of the tribunal was the Indonesian human rights lawyer Nusyabani Kacusunkana. I have the next one, please. <laughs> Nusyabani had a personal experience of People's Tribunals through her involvement as lead prosecutor for the Indonesian team at the 2000 Women's International Tribunal on Japan's military sexual slavery held in Tokyo. In that tribunal, she led the presentation of evidence from Indonesia, including testimony from Indonesian survivors. Uh, next slide. Sorry. The Tokyo Tribunal gave primary place to survivor testimony to profile the suffering of women both at the time of the violence and through post-war discrimination in their societies. The Tribunal aimed to create a permanent public record of that violence that was later preserved in a museum in Tokyo dedicated to the Tribunal and related activism. <coughs> the Tribunal was also video recorded, creating another material form of memory of that event. Although that tribunal had no legal weight, it sought to provide further evidence of the organised nature of the system. It attributed direct responsibility for the system to the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese military and government. The tribunal also included commemoration, famous activists and survivors of the system such as Kim Hatsun, who passed away before the tribunal, were honoured with life-size portraits and candles. Indonesian human rights activists then drew on activist memory, especially of previous tribunals, when thinking about how to increase the profile of the 1965 case. Uh, next slide. Now what people's tribunals have in common is that they are all intended as moral injunctions for cases where justice has not been served due to particular global constellations of power and perhaps global hierarchies of justice. In these global constellations of power, subaltern groups such as former so-called comfort women or victims of an anti-communist repression might rate lowly. The group backing the tribunal then was following a strategy that Keck and Sikink have called the boomerang effect, by which they use international forums to bring pressure to bear from above on their governments to implement changes. It's most often used when advocacy at home is failing. The main coordinators of the IPT then were the Indonesian human rights lawyer, who I mentioned before, Nosya Batni Kachasunkana, but also the Dutch sociologist, Saskia Wieringa, who'd pioneered research into women targeted in 1965. Most of the people involved in the tribunal were, however, Indonesian, Indonesian human rights activists, Indonesian lawyers, um, and also there were participants from the Indonesian exile community in Europe. Like in the case of the Tokyo Tribunal, the organisers sought to create a record of the violence from the perspective of survivors. Um, Ibn Shabani explained the tribunal aimed to provide a public record of the mass killings and other crimes committed. 
Due to budgetary and time constraints, only a select number of survivors spoke at the tribunal, and each survivor represented a different kind of abuse experienced. For example, one man testified to having dug mass graves in 1965, um, and others, you know, for example, gave testimony about experiences of sexual violence or slavery, etc. Next slide. The tribunal also had a performative dimension. Artwork by survivors was displayed on the walls of the foyer in the tribunal building, an old Gothic style church in The Hague. There were candles lit for reflection and remembrance of those who died in the killings so long uh, at the time or long after. Uh, next slide. The tribunal was overseen by a panel of judges headed by the South African judge uh, Yakub, who was a supporter of anti apartheid movement and who served as a constitutional court judge in South Africa. Um, the accused party in this tribunal was the government of Indonesia. The government was on trial for multiple accounts of human rights abuses, including those I mentioned in the National Commission of Human Rights report. But there were many misunderstandings about this tribunal, especially in Indonesia, especially with regard to whether it was a real tribunal, whether it had real legal weight. To counter those misunderstandings and socialise the idea of the tribunal, its advocates set up a website with information about the tribunal, including related press articles. Organisers of the tribunal used new media, including a dedicated bilingual Facebook page, which is a secret page, um, to allow people from around the world to access what was happening at the tribunal and related press coverage. They also, um, from the web page, which is not, uh, not secret, they live streamed um, the proceedings. The Facebook friends of the tribunal website and the website included photos of the tribunal. I've already mentioned that, sorry. For the duration of the tribunal, November 10 to 13, this Facebook page also ran hot with posts. The online content relating to the tribunal meant that those who could not physically attend the tribunal in The Hague, which of course was very prohibitive for many Indonesians trying to find an airfare to attend, could still be virtual audience members. In this sense, the live streaming facilitated greater possibilities also of disseminating um, memories of this event. In the context of activist circles where funding for this topic is difficult and where opposition in Indonesia remains strong, this was also potentially liberating in terms of the slim chance of any potential future museum devoted to this topic in Indonesia. Okay, next slide. I now want to turn to looking at Indonesian responses to the tribunal and to examine some of the connections made between the 65 case and other cases of historical justice. It's important to note that because 2015 marked the 50th year anniversary of the beginning of the violence, there were many events in Indonesia and abroad. And several events, um, such as the profile that literary books on 1965 attracted at the Frankfurt Book Fair and the cancellation by Indonesian police of panels on 1965 at the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival, indicated growing government sensitivity to the internationalization of discussions of 65. In the months preceding the tribunal, the leading Indonesian lawyers representing the case were subjected to increasingly hostile attacks and accused of being traitors to the nation. Some of the strongest criticisms launched, however, were framed in terms of the decision to hold the tribunal in the Netherlands. These critiques built on references to colonial violence and nationalist criticism of the activists behind the tribunal. Uh, next one. So The Hague was chosen as the city to host the tribunal because, quote, it is a symbol of justice and international peace. The Peace Palace is located there as well as the International Criminal Court. Several important special tribunals have been held in The Hague um, or have their secretariats in the city, such as the former Yugoslavia Tribunal, the Tokyo Tribunal, the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal on Japan's military sexual slavery also delivered its verdict in The Hague. <coughs> The tribunal was completely independent of the Dutch government. Following the US government, the Dutch government remained quiet about the 65 killings, prioritising economic ties over human rights, with the exception later in the 1990s of some protests over the East Timor killings by the Indonesian army. Holding the tribunal in the Netherlands, however, was a calculated risk. <clears throat> because the Netherlands is the former colonial power of Indonesia, there are ongoing sensitivities as to how the Dutch treated Indonesians in the past. And these sensitivities have been heightened since 2011 with a series of successful court cases against the Dutch government for massacres during the decolonization war of 1945 to 1949. 
By the time the tribunal was held um, in the Netherlands, though, they had already um, settled two cases relating to the Rawagade and the Westerling massacres. It took 70 years for Indonesians to demand compensation for colonial massacres. In 2013, the Dutch government also decided to extend an apology to victims of all executions during the struggle. It offered compensation to surviving widows, but not children, under strict conditions. Now, interestingly, although Indonesian politicians did not uh, back these cases against former, the former colonial power with any vigour when they occurred, when this tribunal was raised, they suggested in response that the Dutch should settle their own records of violence against Indonesians first. The implication was that they understood the Dutch government was somehow involved in the tribunal. The Vice President, Yusuf Kala, for example, condemned the fact the tribunal was taking place in the Netherlands. He stated, how many people were killed here by the Dutch? If that is the case, we should trial the Dutch here. A million Indonesians could also testify to how the Dutch, colo um, Dutch colonial period was. The coordinating minister for politics, law and security, retired General Luhut Panjaitan said, now I'm going to ask Westerling, Westerling was ahead of the crack troops in the Westerling massacres, I'm going to ask him if he also wants to open up how many Indonesians were killed. Don't just listen to the voices of bule, which means white people, listen also to the voices of Indonesians. Many responses also took a nationalist tone. The Attorney General Prasetyo stated on the 10th of November, the opening day, these are our own problems and we'll solve them, solve them ourselves. There's no need for involvement by other parties. Minister Panjaitan also asked the media, who's going to be trialled? How can they make decisions about us? Adopting a cultural argument reminiscent of the Asian values debate, he suggested that Indonesians were exploring a format that fits an Indonesian way to deal with human rights abuses. The immediate reference point was then the Indonesian nation and a sense that Indonesia needs to settle its own matters without foreign intervention. And this is, an also, this is also an issue of great sensitivity due in particular to Australian interventions in the case of East Timor in 1999 to encourage a ballot for, East Indepe um, for independence in East Timor. It was exactly the intention, however, of the tribunal to call out the Indonesian government for its failure to resolve the 65 case. One actor, An Anshore, noted, quote, those active in the field of advocacy certainly understand the significance of shaming and naming in advocating for a case. Uh, next slide. Sorry. Could you Almost rather there. soon? Yes, going. Next slide. <laughs> I'm trying to speak slowly and, and go fast at the same time. Despite the assertion of some that this was a national matter for Indonesians to deal with, a significant section of the tribunal dealt with foreign complicity in the 1965 violence, especially evidence of the role of the US, the UK and Australia. And this is where another region of memory was evoked, that of the Cold War context of this anti-communist violence. The US foreign relations historian who's pictured here, Bradley Simpson, who's read across the files of the US Embassy in the State Department, testified at the tribunal as an expert witness regarding the role of the US. He stated the US and other Western countries had encouraged the army to strike against the communists at any opportunity. The government provided arms, finances and political support for the violence and the government was also fully aware of the scale of the killings as they unfolded and supported them secretly. He made similar com comments about the US, um, sorry, about Australia and the British. What was the purpose of including foreign powers amongst those accused of responsibility? Again, I think the main reason was to stimulate more international awareness and possibly some related actions from these parties, despite ongoing small-scale activism on this, because despite uh, ongoing small-scale activism on this issue from political exiles and small activist groups based in the UK and other cases, awareness of this case is very low. Following the success of his films, Oppenheimer has advocated for increased US recognition of their part in the 1965 in the form of a resolution now sponsored by Senator Tom Udall of the Democrats of New Mexico. This strategy of advocating for resolutions in foreign countries as a means to pressure another country has been widely used in advocacy for the comfort women. It's been criticised by some as a case of Americanising the issue, as if the US is somehow a global arbiter of justice. Yet in the 65 case, the strategy is to gain acknowledgement of US complicity, so that differently implicated parties might begin to address this past on the conclusion now. So in terms of the aim of um, the tribunal, I do think it increased pressure on the Indonesian government. It was only in the face of ongoing pressure from human rights groups, including 
including preparations for the tribunal, that last year the Attorney General finally conceded to say that they're going to come up with their own reconciliation initiative, although rights activists are very suspect about that because the, the committee includes police and military in the organisation. To date, most studies pertaining to memory of the violence in Indonesia focus on national, local or individual practices of remembrance. But when we think through the case of the 65 violence, it is somewhat artificial to, vo to divorce what happened in Indonesia from global trends. Activists are constantly drawing on a global memory scape for inspiration. Consistent with Michael Rothbard's claim, re multidirectional memory in the field of activism, we see a common referencing or a shared language in memory struggles across time and space. One reason for this is that activists are looking for ways to make cases globally relevant, to shift what has been largely a national memory into the realm of the global, especially when the pursuit of justice at national level fails. From the other side, their opponents, however, also make efforts to draw on other memories to condemn the internationalisation of this issue. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Kate, for this most illustrative presentation. Of course, there's certainly a lot more material to be presented, but we keep in line now with our third presenter, which is Angeliki Musakiti, is that correctly pronounced? Uh, she uh, has a PhD in Balkan history, interesting term, by the way, Balkan history, from Aristotle's University in Thessaloniki, so a most traditional place of learning in Europe, obviously, and um, is at present working in, in Yashi in Romania, it was also the, the, the topic of your, uh, the, the place of you that you describe, as lecturer of modern Greek language, so already has a transnational element in her own career, so to say, and her topic is, well, historically uh, located in that same region, the pogrom of Jews in Yashi in June 1941, the very beginning of the so-called Barbarossa campaign. The memorial sites as part of the post-socialist memory discourse, so also seen in the uh, different time zones that we have to travel, so to say. Okay, PowerPoint, great. Um, Is it already I here? Think. Yes. Um, okay. Mm. Yeah, oh, yeah, I have it. Okay. Yes, tell me. Okay. Okay, floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my topic is about uh, uh, the pogrom of Jews in Yash, a city in the northeastern part of Romania, in June 1941. <coughs> the memorial sites as part of the post-socialist memory discourse. The memorial sites as small memory regions in the city of Iash. The paper focuses on the monuments which commemorate the victims of the pogrom in Iash, which took place between the 28th and the 30th of June, 1941 and was launched by the Romanian and German authorities against the Jewish population. More specifically, out of the 45,000 uh, Jews who lived in Yash at that time and constituted approximately half of the city's population, about 14,000 lost their lives. The exact number figure is still uncertain. Most of them were murdered in the streets, in their houses, and the courtyard of police head headquarters. Thousands more were arrested and deported by trains, death trains, to Kalarash and Podwiloaya. These are cities outside uh, Iash. Many of them died during the deportation due to heat, thirst, and suffocation. This massacre uh, was followed by other massacres committed by both German SS and police and Romanian army and gendarmerie against thousands of Jews in Bessarabia, northern Bukovina, and Transnistria. In the last few years, the commemoration of this inconvenient, traumatic past has been one of the aims of both academic research and public debate. The major differences between the socialist memory discourse, which blamed mainly the German authorities for the massacre and the post-socialist discourse, which points out the responsibilities of the Antonescu regime, Ma Ion Antonescu, who was uh, at the time uh, uh, the leader in Romania, 
and its collaboration with the German officials reflect, of course, different politics of memory and history. Taking into serious consideration both the transnational character of the Holocaust and the specificities of the Romanian Holocaust and the city of Iash, we deal with the way in which the memory places interact with the academic narratives and the public discourse and become a part of a broader post-socialist memory discourse in Romania. In fact, the shift from the collective amnesia and the selective memory, which prevailed during the communist period regarding the Romanian Holocaust and the pogrom of Jews in Yash, to the temporary eruption of memory, it is, it is a term which is used by a, a historian, Alexander Florin Platon, is more than evident both in the historiographical discourse and the memorial sites. The memory regions of the pogrom in Yash are the Yash synagogue, it's the, uh, the only one left out of the 100 and more synagogues which were in, Yash, in the broader region of Yash, the Jewish cemetery, the railway station, and the building at the center of the city, which used to host the police headquarters. The monuments can be divided into two categories. First, those which reshape an already existing memory region, and therefore transform an existing memory discourse into a new one. Secondly, those, those which construct a completely, a completely new memory region in the city. The monuments are the following. The impressive black marble obelisk in front of the great synagogue, I'm going to show it later, not now, okay. later, uh, which was unveiled on the 28th of June 2011 and replaced the obelisk which had been built in the communist period the Popricheni Mass Grave Memorial at the Jewish Cemetery, and the memorial plaques which were put on the building which used to host the police headquarters in the interwar period, where many Jews were murdered or, and tortured, and on the, on the railway station building, the place from where those who had survived the massacre in the city and the torture were deported by trains to places outside the ash. A very characteristic and illuminating example of the major shifts and changes in the official memory discourse concerning the Romanian Holocaust, and more specifically the pogrom in Yash, is the obelisk in front of the Yash synagogue, a place of religious and cultural importance for the Jews. In the first obelisk, next slide, please. This, this one. <coughs> Uh, which was erected in 1976 by the communist authorities, one could read, could read the following. In memory of the victims of the fascist pogrom of Iash, June 28, 29, 1941. In the obelisk that replaced the former communist monument, we read the following text. And the other one? I don't know, it's, yes, here. Okay. Sorry, but. Okay. Uh, in memory of over 13,000 Jews, innocent victims of Yash pogrom of June 28, 30, 1941, during the Ion Antonescu regime, we will not forget. The differences in the discursive elements of these two monuments are more than clear. In the first obelisk, the terms victims and Yash pogrom are vague and are being put in the general context of fascism. Neither the origin of the victims nor the, nor the number of the victims are being mentioned. Of course, the text does not make any reference to the, the responsibilities of the Romanian authorities. The inscription in the new obelisk, however, specifies the origin and the number of the victims, blames the Romanian authorities, and more specifically, Ion Antonescu's regime for the massacre, and makes a clear statement and appeal to the citizens not forget. We will not forget. 
In the first case, we are dealing with the, in the first case with the first obelisk, we are dealing with a quasi invisible character of the memory region. Whereas in the second case, the monument and the memory region are claiming to be part of the collective memory of the Jewish community and the city of Yash. Uh, if you see the picture, the previous picture, first, okay, this one. If you see the picture, it is as if uh, it is visible and invisible. It's like it's a very plain monument. Uh, it is as if the communist authorities had to do it, had to erect a monument. Um, the first monument reflected clearly the official position and discourse of the Communist Party concerning the pogrom in Yash. The pogrom is being put in the context of the struggle between fascists and anti-fascists, whereas the number of the victims with Jewish citizenship is being significantly minimized. The German troops were mainly to blame for the massacre, which were supported by some fascist elements of the Romanian army. This is the phrase which, I, which we found in the bibliography of that time. Although there had been some attempts by some journalists of Jewish origin in the period between 1944 and 1947, for the investigation of the crimes committed against the Jews and the commemoration of the massacre in Romania, negation and selective memory prevailed throughout the communist period. Both in the period between 1948 and 1965, when the Stalinist model formed the ideological basis of the regime, and in the period 1965, 1918, 89, when Ceausescu imposed the model of national communism and promoted a Romanian national ideology, the war crimes were seen as crimes committed by fascists, mostly foreigners and some locals, against communists. Especially in the Ceausescu period, fascism was regarded as a foreign political phenomenon which did not have a significant appeal to the Romanian people, whereas Andonescu was regarded as a leader who tried to secure Romania's independence against Germany and to regain the lost Romanian territories. On the other hand, the second monument embodies all the discursive elements of today's official historical writing and politics of memory regarding the pogrom in Yash and the Romanian Holocaust. Of course, the today's memory and historical discourse has not been shaped through a linear pr process, but through the uh, debates, controversies, and discontinuities which characterize the shift from the communist to the post-communist discourse. The main topics of these controversies were the phenomenon of the Romanian interwar extreme right, anti-Semitism in Romania and the relationship between the intelligentsia of the interwar period and fascist ideology. After 1989, in the context of a Romanian nationalist discourse, many scholars tried to portray Ion Antonescu as a national hero and leader, and the legion of the Archangel Michael movement, a fascist movement, as a positive proponent of the Romanian national ideology. However, there were also other scholars who took a more critical stand and wrote comprehensive studies on, on anti-Semitism and fascism in Romania. 2003 was a landmark year for the shift in the memory discourse in Romania. After the reactions and protests that had been caused by a statement made by the president of Romania, Ion Iliescu, on the occasion of an agreement between the National Archives of Romania and the United States Holocaust Memo Memorial Museum in Washington, that Romania's government encourages research concerning the Holocaust in Europe, but strongly emphasizes that between 1940 and 1945, no Holocaust took place within Romania's boundaries. An international commission on the Holocaust was set up in Romania on October 22nd, 20, 2003, on the initiative of, uh, of President Ion Iliescu. The final report of the International Commission on the Holocaust, which was presented to Romanian President Ion Iliescu in November 2004, 
defined the term Holocaust as a systematic persecution of Jews in Europe, which was organized by Nazi Germany and its allies and collaborators. As for the Jews in Romania, the report states that a significant part of the Jewish community in Romania was exterminated during the Second World War. The Commission concludes that the Romanian authorities bear the main responsibility for the planning and implementation of the Holocaust in Romania. The content and the conclusions of the report gave impetus to numerous publications in the fields of oral history, historiography, memory studies concerning the Holocaust in Romania. 2011 was also a landmark year for the memory discourse concerning the Yash pogrom. On the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the massacre, the memory regions become, became now an integral and dynamic part of the academic and public discourse. It is not coincidental that apart from the international conference, which was organized at the Alexander Ioan Cusa University in June 2011, another conference took place at the same time in the place Podul Iloaye, a place outside Iash, with the main goal, the exchange of experiences between professors who organize activities with students for the commemoration of the Holocaust. According to the organizers of the conference, Podul Iloaye, this place, was selected as the place of the conference because there, exi there exists the Jewish cemetery and because it was the place where the death trains passed. At the ceremony in front of the great synagogue, when the new obelisk was also inaugurated, many descendants of Jews joined the survivors of the massacre in order to commemorate the tragic events. The commemorative event, along with the inauguration of the obelisk, had a very large media coverage. The Romanian president, Traian Basescu himself, sent a message with the following words. Nobody, nowhere, can find an excuse nor a justification for what happened in Yash. The Yash pogrom, as well as the tragedy of the Holocaust as a whole, is a shocking chapter of Romania's history and should force us to assume our responsibilities for the serious errors committed in the past. Can we move forward? Yes. yes. The Jewish cemetery, which is outside the city, this is here, only one part of it, uh, constitutes also a memory place of great importance, which has been reshaped and transformed as a discourse during the last few years. It is a memory place where, in fact, two memory discourses coexist. We don't have here replacement. We have two memory, we have two monuments. We don't have the case with the obelisk replacing the other. Okay, we have two monuments coexisting. Uh, the first uh, memory discourse is reflected on the memorial plaque which was put on a mass grave during the Socialist period by the Federation of Jewish Communities of the Socialist Republic of Romania, and the second one on the Popreciani Mass Grave Memorial. Um, further? Okay. The first memorial plaque informs on the killings and sufferings of the Jewish people in Romania, which were caused by racists, fascists, and anti Semites. It gives emphasis on the transnational character of the Holocaust, on the global character, and does not mention anything about the responsibilities of the local authorities. The Popricini Mass Grave Memorial. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this is for the one there. Yeah. And next one? I'll get there. Um, reflects. Uh, the post-socialist discourse, since it mentions that Ion Antonescu was to blame for the massacre and points out the local dimension of the tragedy. <coughs> so we read, here rest the remains of 36 Jews, nine women, 12 children, and 15 men, victims of the Ion Antonescu regime, which were murdered in June 1941 in the Volturi Fort forest of Popricani Township. 
The mass grave was discovered in November 2010 by a team of researchers of the Elie Wiesel National Institute for the Study of the Holocaust in Romania. We must remember, so it will not happen again. As we have already mentioned, apart from the transformation and reshaping of already existing memorial regions, we deal also with the creation of completely new ones. This is the case of the memorial region which was created in 2011, created, quote, by the memorial plaque which was set up on the building which used to host the police headquarters. Okay, this one. Huh? This new memory place differs in many ways from the other ones. The basic difference is that it is not linked to any impressive monument of religious or cultural significance. On the contrary, it is situated in the center of the city of Yash, on a crowded street. The text we read as we pass by the building is the following. In this place, where the police headquarters used to be, were brought on the 29th of June, 1941. After they had been arrested, thousands of Jews, victims of the pogrom organized by the authorities of the Antonescu's regime. Romanian soldiers, policemen, but also citizens, along with German soldiers, participated in the massacre of their Jew co-citizens in the courtyard of the headquarters and in the streets of the city. 4,432 of those who survived the massacre were sent uh, in the train station and were deported. The Bogrom in Iash was the greatest massacre committed against the Jews in the territory of Romania. May the memory of this tragedy remain alive as a prevention for the future generation. National Institute for the Study of the Holocaust in Romania, June 2011. As we read the, te the, the above text, we can uh, understand that the goal of this text is the transmission of a clear message to the, citizen, to the citizens concerning the character and the dimensions of this massacre in Yash. It gives all the information and details and puts deliber deliberately emphasis on the fact that in the tragic events participated Romanian citizens. In conclusion, the post-socialist memory discourse in Romania concerning the Romanian Holocaust serves multiple goals. First of all, the condemnation of the atrocities of Adonescu's regime. But more than that, the rejection of the communist politics of memory concerning the tragic and traumatic events. And the promotion of the image of Romania as a European and multicultural society ready to come to terms with its recent traumatic past. In the case of the monuments in Iash, the city, which used to have the largest Jewish community in Romania, emphasis is given, among others, on the local and specific character of the pogrom and on Iash's citizens' uh, duty to commemorate the massacre in order to prevent intolerance, anti-Semitism, and negative stereotypical images of the other from undermining, uh, undermining the multicultural ca uh, character of the local society in the future. Uh, before, in order to conclude, I would say that this memorial plaque uh, made me want to do this presentation. Uh, it is not in a, it's not put in a pre, in an impressive place. I had passed by many times at the street without paying any attention to it, and I think that that was I don't know. This is what, this is how I received it as an individual. This. That is how, what uh, they wanted to, this was the message they wanted to pass. That it's something, it's, it's something that you may not pay an attention, but it's happening. That is how I received it. I wait for your proposals for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will immediately give the floor to our discussant, Małgorzata Pakia from the Poland History of Polish Jews here in Warsaw, but also closely connected to the Generation of Memories project, and very curious about her comment and 
assessment of our presentations. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the papers uh, which I read with great interest and I must admit that I read them in a very uh, selective way, trying to focus on what is regional in them so that uh, they help us, uh, as it's the point, point of the conference, to conceptualize what's, what it means, a regional memory. And the regional was not always uh, explicitly stated there, but it is all the more interesting to, to talk about it. Um, I identified uh, that uh, it will be, of course, a bit simplifying what I will say because I was trying to put all these three papers uh, together and find what was uh, uh, common to them. Uh, that there were um, that in all the papers uh, you were speaking uh, or referring to uh, two kinds of narratives. Uh, they were on the one hand national narratives. On the other hand, uh, global, universal, European narratives. And the regional was somehow implicit or somewhere in between. And uh, the, the global narratives were uh, the human right, uh, rights discourse uh, and also the Holocaust memory, global Holocaust memory, which I would uh, differentiate from European Holocaust memory. Uh, the global Holocaust memory is more about commemorating uh, the victims of the Holocaust. I don't know if you agree with that. While the European narrative uh, of, of the Holocaust is more focusing on the issue of perpetration. It is more in the direction of self-criticism, -critic self-critical reckoning with uh, national uh, histories, with the dark moments in national past, self-critical reckoning with this romantic mm -hmm. uh, code of nations, at, as Sławek uh, Kapralski uh, mentioned. Um, and then it seemed that uh, there was a clear relation between these two kinds of narratives, the national and the, let's call them universal, global Europe European. Uh, they were in opposition to each other. Uh, they were contesting each other. And there was also a relation of power between them. So um, it was either that uh, they were used by memory agents to, uh, to, to fight against the dominating narratives, as for example in, uh, in your case where the agents were referring to the uh, human rights discourse, to the tribunal, international tribunals to question the national narratives which for them were dominating, while the reaction, the uh, domestic reaction was also that there is this domination from outside, that they are being imposed. Mm -hmm. uh, and also in uh, Swavek's uh, uh, case, I also had the impression, well, you actually said that, that there was the resistance, the domestic resistance to the European narratives, which was seen as a threat to, to the uh, fragile existence in the, trans era, in, the, in, in the era of transformation. Um, and also uh, uh, in, 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 the last, in the last paper, there was also this kind of dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the already existing memory, which is the dominating one, and the other that is coming from the outside that is sometimes intervening and sometimes it is uh, the one that is defeating. Um, so this would be the question to you. Uh, do you see, how do you understand regional memories? Can, you, can we imagine them uh, be re beyond the relation of domination and power uh, within the on the line of the, of, of the opposition between the national and the European or the global? Uh, how can we find something um, that would be original and uh, for, for, the, for the regional memories? Original memories uh, identical with with the national only on a larger scale, or is there something new when we approach these memories from the uh, regional perspective? Mm. This would be. Um, 
it also when looking at it uh, uh, on a dis different aspect, um, what struck me was also the relation between the producers of memories and the receivers of memories, if you could reflect on that. Uh, the content and the reception. Uh, sometimes I had the feeling that the reception was quite passive, uh, that they were uh, the the, the people that uh, how would you see that how people are referring to the narratives, to the codes that are existing, how are they transforming them? Um, I, I wouldn't just label it as it sometimes was the case that there was a rejection and resistance and uh, it was not uh, appropriated. Mm. As Wavek, you mentioned also about the institutions that are needed to uh, form a collective memory. Could we imagine institutions that could help develop uh, memories uh, in developing memories on the regional level? Um, and another question to all of you is about uh, what are the triggers for, uh, for um, regional memories? Uh, as we know, remembering has these two uh, dimensions, two frames. One is the past and one is the horizon of expectation. So, and uh, it seems uh, sometimes the regions of memory are uh, somehow uh, appearing because uh, of the EU entry, for example, mm -hmm. as was mentioned, the ticket uh, to the uh, European Union. Uh, so uh, contemporary political uh, aspirations may, may also be the ones that uh, stimulate developing of these regional narratives. Mm. Yes, so in general, I would like to ask you at the very end that uh, how could you define uh, the regional memories in your case to state more uh, explicitly uh, also in terms of the area or of the imagined uh, uh, region uh, but also stating or maybe uh, stipulating who are the agents, who are the carriers, who, who, which could be the institutions of regional memories, uh, how how the process of production uh, looks like. What, what is the process of production of these memories? Um, what is the dynamics and the structure uh, specific to regional memories, which is different from national memories and different from the uh, global and, and the European uh, discourses that we already uh, know? And this would be it. Thank you. Thank you very much. They are to all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. As you have asked questions, I suggest so our panelists will of course answer this question. I don't know how much time we will have afterwards for general discussion when we have to stop here. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Till seven. Okay. So let's first begin with in in maybe the same order as we as we as you talk, just uh, address the questions by Mawajata. Okay, these questions that you asked are very uh, general and some of them are not applicable to my presentation because uh, it was based on certain assumptions, you know, that uh, uh, you know, consciously removed from my attention uh, uh, certain uh, problems that are important uh, uh, for regional memory. So, for example, by regional memory, I mean national memory for my uh, as for my paper is concerned, but I can comment on some other uh, options because I was interested in uh, the uh, memory of a certain category of poles vis-a-vis -vis the globalized discourse on the one hand and the uh, national uh, uh, cultural uh, codes. That was uh, in my uh, uh, presentation the uh, main problem. You know, why the globalized discourse has been rejected and not used in practice for organizing personal re re remembrance and recollections um, uh, 
and what uh, uh, it indicates in uh, social uh, uh, terms. This indicates actually a cleavage between those who produce memories and those who receive memories, which can be sociologically translated into the cleavage between elites and masses, or those who benefited out of the transformation and those who were um, underdogs and who uh, felt uh, 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 being uh, losers of a transition um, uh, period. The second category thought to be somehow uh, obliged to catch up, you know, to, to make an effort to buy a ticket, yeah, uh, to learn something, to switch, yeah, which they reject because they um, haven't seen any um, benefits. You know. uh, they perceive that as a sort of a, a assault uh, on their uh, newly regained right uh, not to make an effort you know, uh, after the collapse of, um, uh, of communism. Uh, however, uh, I could easily develop that into a, a a more complicated model when the global national would be supplemented with the local uh, level. And here, actually, I could find some interesting illustrations uh, that would be uh, different, uh, I mean, uh, than the general picture. In many uh, localities in uh, Poland, the Jewish memory actually is commemorated, not because of some alienated elitist uh, efforts, but out of the genuine need of the local community. However, this genuine need is often taken a form of a commercialized uh, activity, for instance, to attract tourists. Many of these localities are exploiting the Jewish theme uh, in order to present uh, these places as uh, uh, multicultural uh, uh, and therefore attractive uh, uh, to, um, uh, to the visitors. So there is some sort of a concerted uh, uh, action or a coalition between towns, councils, and some local enthusiasts who are retrieving Jewish memory, and the results are very decent. You know, I, uh, I would say that uh, some of them are, uh, are really uh, interesting, noble, and um, poor of respect. However, this is not just a, a, a simple search for memory for memory's sake. This is a, a, a result of a complicated process of negotiation in which material interests, certain uh, ideas of identity coexist and produce uh, results which are sometimes naive, sometimes decent, sometimes um, uh, stupid. Um, uh, uh, but there is definitely a chance that something new can emerge merge on the local uh, uh, level. So the global, the national, and the local, uh, so my concept of originality would be somehow in between these three uh, categories. Uh, so I think that I answered the question, what are the institution at the regional level that could trigger original memory? Uh, and the last thing that I want to uh, comment, I don't think that actually uh, this was a pass passive uh, reception uh, 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 of the uh, globalized narratives of memory that I was um, uh, talking about in, in my presentation. I think that those people whom I interviewed 25 years ago, they were actually quite active, but um, it was difficult to see, especially at that time. They were not rejecting the uh, discourse uh, passively. They were rather trying to avoid uh, a closer contact with that discourse by activating a different uh, a segments of culture or cultural resources that were not present in the discourse. I've already mentioned the beginning of my presentation that quite strangely they referred to anti-Semitism uh, when they were asked about the Holocaust, not earlier. Uh, so when they start about the general relations between uh, Jewish and non-Jewish inhabitants of the uh, localities, uh, there was no anti-Semitism there. But when asked about mm, uh, the Holocaust, they uh, enact 
the anti-Semitic uh, um, uh, code, uh, because that could help them to avoid an encounter with uh, this course that was perceived by them as a part of a danger, as a part of the process that would force them to, to do something, to change. Uh, their self-perception, you know, to make an effort. That's what people uh, don't particularly like, especially in the times of uh, um, crisis. But I would say that their avoidance to accept the uh, uh, discourse of the Holocaust was pretty active. Uh, that was uh, something that they really um, had to uh, maybe not consciously plan, but they, they had to refer to several resources you know, and make, make an effort not to uh, accept uh, the discourse, if this is... Now it's your turn. Thank you. Um, you've given us a lot of homework there. <laughs> I think I'll need to take a lot of the questions away. Um, but, yeah, I mean, perhaps it did come across that I was talking about competing dominations. That's an, an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, but what I wanted to also point out was that there was multiple cross-referencing in that process and by trying to look at particular activists and what um, activism they'd also been involved in before I was trying to link what they were doing with also a memory of activism as well. So not just perhaps competition over one dominating national narrative. I think that increasingly um, Indonesian human rights activists as well have looked across the globe and also starting to look at South America where there's also parallel experiences of repressions of the political left. And they're trying to also um, see themselves as remaking understandings maybe of the Cold War as a meta-narrative in the West, at least um, the Cold War for Indonesia, it was extremely hot war, a violent war. So I see in some NGO reports that they're also trying to remake a narrative of the Cold War by introducing their case study. Um, oh, what was I going to say? Uh, other questions there? So I think also we can never take power out of the equation in terms of domination and power, in terms of which cases have been taken up globally, you know, in terms of the tribunal, the people's tribunals. They have been in cases where people do not feel there was another avenue um, for justice. So I guess it's not just memory at stake here, it's also people, um, you know, trying to make claims on the basis of the suffering that they've experienced before. Um, what else? What institutions could help develop memory on the regional level? Well, I've sort of been struck by also that the, maybe some cultural mediums like that film, what effects do they have in terms of internationalising an issue, extending the memory of one country into the realm of others? But, you know, I haven't looked at particular countries, the reception of this film. I think that's an important um, thing to do. Um, in terms of people who were, you know, watching the, the tribunal or maybe watching the website, that would be interesting to, to monitor as well in terms of the reception of this tribunal as a creation of a site of memory as well. Um, there are definitely comments like on the, the pages and Facebook kind of pages from many everyday Indonesians who are also taking up this issue of colonial violence as well, so a lot of cross-referencing. Um, but that's about all I can say for now. You've given me a lot of homework. Thanks. Okay. Uh, regarding the first um, topic you said about producers and receivers of the memory. Uh, okay, one thing is producers, another thing is receivers. I will give you an example of my own personal experience. Before I came here to the conference, I did a little bit of unofficial research. I, I told my students the topic of the conference, and what I'm, I was going to talk about, the Romanian students. Okay, the answers were from, there was no pogrom, complete denial, questions such as, why do you want to do this? And of course, some uh, answers of selective memory. Okay, but, okay, but, but the Jews, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is something because, okay, this is a, a memory discourse that is, uh, has been produced in the last years. So, uh, the Romanian citizens uh, still have not been able to come to terms with this. Uh, secondly, 
you, uh, you asked me why the contemporary, something about uh, Europe or America, something like that. Uh, why it's been, um, uh, I don't know, this memory discourse is uh, promoted. Uh, now, uh, the, those, the institutions which are implicated in this, uh, in IASH, uh, is the University of IASH and other academic institutions, which are getting, uh, which are getting funds from European projects. Uh, in terms of regional memory, and how this regional memory, um, what is the relation of regional memory with the national narrative? Uh, I think that uh, in this case, by promoting the regional memory, in the case of the pogrom of Yash, uh, they try to promote the new uh, national post-communist narrative. The goal is not so much to condemn Ion Antonescu regime and what happened at that time. It is the first goal. I think that the other most serious goal is the condemnation of the communist politics of memory, of how the, in the communist period they remembered these events. So by promoting the regional memory in Yash, uh, they, do not, uh, they do not reject the national narrative. They try to promote a new national narrative. And they try to promote the image of Romania as a multicultural and European country, which, has, which tries to come to terms with, this, with its past. I don't know if I answered that. Okay, thank you very much for this first round of answers. Now I would like to give opportunity to the floor to speak up, so I don't know about the exact order. Maybe, Your Honor, you start, then Professor Lim, and then we continue. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for this panel. I have a one comment and a question, or two questions. And so I think there is something which connects both of your talks under the umbrella of the regional memory, which is the avoidance to accept the Holocaust narrative in the very land where the Holocaust happened. And you, we could hear you know, more cases, case studies like that from Ukraine, Belarus, Hungary, and other countries. And I think Slavic very well explained why it happened. So I, I would stipulate that, that your explanation would also hold for other, for other localities, perhaps. But I do have, um, I would like to make a several qualification to your general frame, which I like very much, but um, I'm not sure, first of all, if, the, if this communist Marxist whitewashing is an explanation of, uh, of the avoidance of the admitting, uh, not perhaps the Holocaust as a central narrative, because you obviously need to have a whole symbolism and to, to know the narrative to, to accept it, but to make uh, that of Jews as a central event of the war memories. Well, well, we all know that that was not communist Marxist, which was, uh, uh, which was kind of central narrative uh, since 1960s in Poland, same in Romania, but that was very much national already at that time. So that's just a small qualification to that what you said. And the other th question of mine actually is when you say that this nostalgic image of the past years brings some comfort uh, uh, in present identity crisis, meaning the transformation crisis. Uh, is it a hypothesis or would you kind, do you have an evidence of identity crisis in the Polish countryside at, uh, in the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the 1990s? And just a question to uh, Angeliki. Could you comment a little bit on the agency behind the monuments? Yeah, that's it. Um, Yes, one question to Angeliki, perhaps following up this Johanna's question. I mean, you know, the system or regime or structure does not kill 
It is living individuals, living people who kill living people. But in those inscriptions, there is no mention at all who killed. Right? No. It's uh, under, under the, uh, okay. right? So I mean that, so for me, the, what matters is not whether this is national or global memory, but is there any mention who killed, who are perpetrators, right? Yes. This is, I think, the request. And the, one small question to uh, Slavomir uh, Kapraski. Is there any, for example, uh, interviews which has been done to the same individual in intervals. I mean, for example, in Japanese case, we have a very interesting interviews done to same individual in 30 years interval. Immediately after the Second World War, the OSS made an interview with Japanese people without noticing that we are recording. And they said, oh, I should have committed suicide when the uh, Japan surrender and something like very much uh, the Tenno ideology imbued you know, remembering. And then after 30 years, the NHK made the same interview with the same people. Oh, I was so relieved by that Japan was defeated by the United States. We, now we could go, could go to the, into the democracy and so on. And then these NHK people turn on the radio recorder and then they let them, listen, is it me? Are you sure? So I mean, that this is a very good example that how the people's, the same individual's memory of the, what happened past actually changes from the, the, the prevailing framework uh, in a given period. So is there any such an uh, interview of a same individual in intervals has been done in, 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 in this area? Okay. Thank you for three uh, very, very interesting papers, which for me resonated very well with each other. Um, I have two questions, and the first one is really, it, it's addressed to all of you, but I think particularly to uh, Angeliki, um, about the question of language. I was very struck by some of the uh, memorials that you showed us. Some of them had English, and some only had Romanian, and others had Romanian and Hebrew. So what does the use of language tell us about the role of these sort of acts of remembrance as a way of displaying to the outside world. So it's not just a, a talking to the Romanians, but also a way of talking to what one might call the international community or something like that. So I'm interested in your, your comments, but perhaps the others' comments too, on the role of language uh, and what it says about this type of relations. And the second question links to that and, and picking up on, on something that Slavomir Krabalski said about the sense of resentment of the sort of interference from outside. Uh, and on that I'd like to ask Kate about the interference from outside in the case of Indonesia. As you mentioned the fact that the Dutch government has apologized in two cases. And as far as I've understood it, uh, that those apologies were not actually initiated from Indonesians asking for apologies, but they were in fact imposed by activists from Holland um, who, uh, as it were, persuaded the Indonesian uh, locals that they wanted, that they needed an apology. Um, and this it links to the Oppenheimer's uh, website also is trying to, has a campaign for getting the, uh, the uh, Indonesian government to, ap to apologize. So in both cases you have a, uh, an interference from outside which is uh, calling on this uh, global template of the public apology and then we're imposing it on the in Indonesia and so I'm wondering about if you agree with that analysis on it and if so how then do you see the role of the outsider as it were in in the process in Indonesia would you say that this on on average is this a um, has this been a positive development that it's it's helped to uh, move things in Indonesia or would you see it rather as an example of a type of sort of moral high ground coming from outside saying to um, you know you get your house in order, which has then, by accident, as it were, ended up ha causing a reflection on America. Mm -hmm. But that rather by accident than by intent. So I'm interested in your, in your thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay, please. Mm -hmm. I think you're next, you're next. So, sh oh, or, uh, first, I have a round of answers, then 
first answer. I mean, like, because I wanted to ask a question which is some kind of connected with this question we just previously asked, so maybe I will add that, if yeah. I may. Uh, because I just, I don't know, uh, actually it's a question to Professor Kaplowski. I don't know whether you are familiar with this controversial book of uh, Professor Leather published last year. Uh, so the idea there is uh, actually um, this lack of remembrance about the Holocaust in the Polish society is the fact that there is a lack of comfort because of the economy. So the fact that actually a lot of Poles, they build their nowadays uh, economic situation, they developed their individual uh, possessions because they took what uh, previously belonged to the Jews. So this um, idea it's uh, behind that is that uh, the, it has to be rejected because it's causing that actually some kind of psychological uh, psychological troubles, lack of comfort. So I just wanted to ask you whether you agree with this idea or what do you think generally about the uh, latter approach to this question? Okay, uh, so maybe I sh answer first your question because my answer is very simple, no. Uh, we didn't, uh, uh, we would love to interview the same person uh, in the time span of 25 years, but it turned out to be uh, impossible. Uh, you know, the youngest people whom we interviewed in 1990 had, uh, were uh, 70 years old. Uh, so uh, 25 years later uh, they could have been 95 uh, and uh, unfortunately we haven't found uh, any uh, of our former uh, speaking partners fit enough to um, uh, have another conversation. So what we did instead was that we were trying to interview their family members, next generation, coming to the households and asking, listen, we've been here 25 years ago, been talking to your father, uh, could you please uh, talk to, now, to us now? Yeah. So it worked in some cases. If they didn't work, we were just going to the next household uh, to have uh, interviews from the same uh, area. But unfortunately no um, uh, uh, no situation that that was the same uh, person uh, regarding the um, uh, Marxist uh, discourse this is a complicated issue you know generally speaking I, I I mentioned this only to indicate that official communist policy of memory blocked certain um, discourses to appear in the public space uh, that was the control of publications the com control of what uh, is uh, placed uh, in the public space as uh, in a form of a memorial or uh, or uh, or a memorial tablet or, or whatever so uh, it's only in this negative understanding of course. Um, uh, however, uh, there is a, a, a special issue about that uh, since the end of 1960s, Polish communist uh, discourse, Marxist discourse, start to be somehow mixed up with the nationalist uh, uh, elements. Uh, and this is actually something what, uh, uh, what I would uh, like to ask Angeliki, uh, because uh, in many ways, uh, it it is uh, surprising to me that in Romania, uh, uh, contemporary uh, institutions, uh, authorities, or regular people are so eagerly rejecting this, uh, let's say, Marxist uh, discourse because, in a way, they also reject the part of the uh, nationalist legacy. Because <laughs> R Romanian communism was similar to Polish in this uh, respect. Yeah. Uh, so for uh, for some of our our speaking partners, communism was bad, but they were still adopting the communist message because it was, when at the time when they were uh, younger, uh, it was delivered a certain national message, and this is something what they could uh, uh, learn watching the communist memorials. Uh, to the co members of the communist party who brought back Polish national independence. Yeah? That was a part of the memorial tab in one of the towns in southern Poland, actually on the area of the Jewish cemetery, which was leveled to the ground. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> 
so in this way, I understand that this could be a problem. Uh, about this um, uh, um, uh, problem of identity crisis, that's a very good question, you know, because 25, 25 years ago, we didn't ask them about their identities. That was not our topic. Huh? We uh, had at that time uh, some sort of a naive understanding that, that people are telling us the past, how they remember it. Yeah? Um, uh, and, uh, and we didn't care about their problems. Um, we were young and the world started to be open for us. Yeah? We didn't have any identity crisis and we didn't assume that our 70 years old uh, speaking partners may have any. But now we are a bit older and we start to understand what they could think. And um, that's why I'm using this as a, a hypothesis. I don't have evidence, but now when I'm recalling my uh, situation as an interviewer, I start to remember that, that these people were really scared. They were asking us, people coming from big town you know, with the university education, listen, mister, tell us, please, what's going to happen? Is it true that the Germans will come and buy our land? Um, they were afraid of these things, and we were, of course, laughing at that. That was not our topic, but now I start to remember, which is another argument that I am not sure whether I am talking about their memories or about my memories of their memories. Um, but that's a good question. We should somehow sort it out. About Leder's book, I appreciate this book very much. Uh, uh, however, this book is based on an entirely different theoretical concept. I'm not uh, rejecting that concept. I think it's a very valuable uh, uh, concept of uh, repressing a certain sense of guilt that came out of the fact that uh, non-Jewish Poles uh, filled in the the, this vacuum left by the murdered uh, Jews and start to benefit uh, uh, from the Holocaust even if they didn't participate uh, directly. Um, I, ap I appreciate this, but this is based on sort of a common sense theory of memory, namely that something what happened in the past influences uh, the way people remembered this uh, event later uh, on. It may work in several ways, uh, but it's already uh, done. I mean, Leder already wrote a good book on this. So I want now to write my book, uh, and Leder wrote already on that. Yeah? That's why I'm uh, trying to find out uh, uh, an alternative approach in which we would start in the present and try to show the memory as the result of the present concerns. Uh, so to reverse the whole uh, uh, mechanism, but this is not against Leder, whom uh, I really admire, uh, especially for the style of this, uh, of this book. Uh, um, Okay, maybe you no know, Lacan uh, slash Zizek is perhaps too much for this interpretation, but, but anyway, these are the details. I really like it. Uh, and this is not in opposition to. Uh, I'm just, I just want to, uh, to present an, an alternative approach. I think that uh, the one represented by Leder or Professor Tokarska Bakir is, is the one very respectable. The other is the culturalist approach of Alina Tsawa, when you know, the attitudes of Poles towards the past is explained by the reference to some cultural patterns that are, exist outside of history. And I think in some circumstances it is also a viable uh, explanation. But I'm looking now for the third way. Thank you for that question, Anne. I'll just explain a little bit more. Back Going back to the Dutch colonial cases, those cases were brought by an organisation which again runs a website, very interesting, called the Committee for Dutch Honorary Debts. And that is a, a, the name of that organisation also mirrors a Dutch organisation for honorary debts against the Japanese in World War II. So I think in a way it's paralleling what happened before. In that organisation, it's driven by an Indonesian migrant, Jeffrey Pondag, who grew up in the, in the Netherlands, you might 
might know about him. And I think he has an interesting kind of um, discourse about the way Indonesians are still perhaps viewed in the Netherlands. He feels sort of there's an element of racism and views about this. So he drives, I think, that organisation to some extent. And he's also working with some activists in Indonesia, although I don't feel there's a huge groundswell from where this came from. And he's working in collaboration with a Dutch lawyer, Lijsk Bissevelde, who is also works in the Han Nohanovic Foundation, which is connected to touch role in um, Sabrenica massacres, etc. So there's all these intersections going on here. Um, but interestingly, this case of Rawagede again came about on the 50th anniversary of the Indonesian Declaration of Independence when a Dutch uh, media crew came to Indonesia and followed um, uh, followed up the story of a former Dutch veteran who, again, interestingly, he didn't tell his story directly to the media. He left an account, kind of, um, I think delivered it to a newspaper, I can't remember the exact story, in a town in the Netherlands where there had been, um, you know, um, massacres of Jews in the hope that the empathy would be there when he disclosed his experience as a traumatised soldier of what he had participated in Indonesia in the um, decolonisation war. So he disclosed that story and that led journalists to go to Indonesia and find out the story. And I think through that process perhaps villagers also became a bit more aware. So it's interesting to think about how did this go down to the village level where I think like the comfort women there was this new introduction of a new discourse that what you experienced through your husband perhaps being massacred in, in the colonial era, they began to reformulate seeing this as actually a violation of my human rights. So there's this introduction of a new discourse to them perhaps they were not using before. And I've looked at the media reporting around this and it's a much more individualised memory. Previously the nation had construed this as a national sacrifice that Indonesians had died in this independence struggle, but of course it was sometimes particularly Indonesians and people were left behind as a result of this violence. So I think there was a reformulation maybe at the village level so I don't see it totally as coming from the outside certainly the discourses were but it had a resonance and certainly we can't forget that there are people on the ground here who did suffer but perhaps also living under an authoritarian regime for so long human rights discourses was not very much socialized so it's something new and the extent to which it's filtered down is also perhaps not that new um, in that case interestingly I felt I looked I've written about this as well so I've I feel that the Indian Indonesian government was quite hesitant to support those cases. They kind of stood back. Yeah, maybe they, I don't think they attended those apology meetings because to do so would be to open the Pandora's box. They've been living under a military dominated regime with so many other cases of parallel cases of violence, especially Westerling led crack troops into South Sulawesi. The Indonesian military led crack troops all throughout Indonesia in 1965. There were just so many parallels there. Um, in terms of the Oppenheimer apology campaign, he ran that campaign in unison with the UK-based organisation TAPOL, which was formed by an Indonesian, um, um, a British um, woman, Kamal Budiaujo, married to Indonesia, who was imprisoned also for three years in 65 and started this organisation. So there's a link kind of a little bit more directly to Indonesia. but. Although, you know, um, you know, Oppenheimer gets so much press, probably more than a lot of Indonesians on this issue, including survivors of the violence. Perhaps Pramudio Natsul was another kind of icon as a survivor, an Indonesian literary writer. But I don't see this as only outsiders bringing the issue to Indonesia. Unfortunately, in the press, it's not disclosed as much how much activism has occurred in Indonesia, Indonesian filmmaking, Indonesian playmaking, etc. Um, in the arts world, but also in activist world, there is so much going on in Indonesia. So in 2001, the most liberal president to date in Indonesia offered an apology. Um, this was Abdurrahman Wahid as the head of the largest Muslim organization in Indonesia, which was implicated in the violence. He offered a personal apology to survivors of the violence for what he felt his organization had done. And he did so while he was president, but in this private capacity. And he also proposed lifting the ban on communism which has been in place since 1966, which led to a, bar, a large backlash. So amongst the demands of former political prisoners, when you ask, is this just coming from outside, I think we need to return to what are the demands of the people actually affected. Well, and again, you can't generalise across them, all of them. Some would not want to touch this issue because they're so traumatised they wouldn't share their story. They maybe haven't shared the story with their families. But some do demand, that, in particular, that there is some kind of truth-telling alongside this ongoing narrative that, that they were about they were traitors, they deserve what they got. And they call at least 
for rehabilitation of themselves. And I guess an apology is also an important step in acknowledging harms against them. So I, I wouldn't see this as only externally driven. And But yes, it's important to reflect on, I guess, people's positions in this and the potential for moralising. But yeah, um, unfortunately, also in Indonesia, this idea of external or you know Asian human rights has also been used as a, a way to rebuff any claims for human rights in Indonesia for so long that we have to be wary of that as well. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, firstly, I would like to answer your question. Who killed? Uh, it is clear in the last moment monuments, it was clearly written that the, Rom uh, the Romanian authorities and citizens killed. So it was. It is very. It is very very important because in the previous monuments, in the socialist period, it was mentioned that it was the German authorities. No mention on on the, on the blame of on the local authorities. And in the case of the memorial plaque, the last one I showed, it it is said that uh, the citizens, the Romanian citizens to participate in the massacre of their co-citizens. For me, this co-citizens is the key word here. It was very, it is shocking. Uh, about the language, the use of language. Uh, okay, it is uh, clear that it is, a, it is an effort to uh, globalize this memory, regional memory. Everybody should know about what happened there. and. Uh, this uh, also mass grave is just that because I uh, discussed with the people there, they told me just the, the starting point because it's a team of researchers that they are looking for the, uh, the remains of other people who were buried in mass graves. Uh, the, the, uh, regarding the questions, the question about the agency, uh, who, who is implicated? Institutes in Yash. Of course, the University of Alexandria and Cusa. The irony is that it's the same university where, in the 30s, there were student organizations with pro-fascist orientation. This is the ironic part. Ironic part. Uh, institutes from Europe and especially from America for the study of Holocaust. And last but not least, the question about uh, why Romanians this is a question of, it could be a topic of a whole conference. Uh, the, the Romanians reject, totally reject, the first phase of the communist period until 60, uh, 1965, with the so-called Sovietic period. In, in terms of the, okay, of the period, the Ceausescu period, they do not reject uh, the elements of the nationalist ideology. No, they reject other aspects of Ceausescu's policy. Selective. selective. This is selective. This is the interesting part. So, thank you, all of you, very much. It's five past seven, so I think I have to close this panel now, and you've held out a very long time. Thank you very much to the presenters, our discussion, and to all of you who participated in the discussion. I think it was a very fruitful panel. I think now it's also time to close for today, and hopefully see you tomorrow freshly. Good night. Thank you.